Hello and welcome to the Press On Podcast. It is our goal here to encourage you through the use of simple spiritual conversations to press on in your walk with Christ. My name is Kyle Blevins. I'm joined today by my friend Brad Harris. And we are going to be jumping into the Gospel of Mark, specifically chapter 5, as we consider the account of Jesus healing the man with many demons. We hope that this conversation will encourage you to start conversations in your own life. It's already begun here. We thank you for joining in. As you go through the Gospel of Mark, really there's a lot of things uh, that that come to mind about who Jesus is. Uh, you know, Brad, what are some things that, that stand out to you that he has done um, through the course of this Gospel? Well, prior to this account, we, we see him... Uh, calming a storm so he has he has the power of, of nature and he's healed several people as well before this so he has, he has the power of a sickness those are those are the things that kind of stick out to me about yeah the power of jesus yeah i think that's that's fascinating that he all of this power seems to be really uh it, it's being emphasized in the gospel of mark he, he really wants us to know um you think about him coming into contact even with with lepers uh, and he, he touches them, and, and yet he's not made unclean. The leper is made clean. So there's just very, very much an emphasis on the power that Jesus has. And, and another word that is used earlier on in the, in the Gospel of Mark is his authority. Mark chapter 1 talks about how he spoke as a man with authority. And so uh, when he says something, when he says, you mentioned the, the storm in the prior chapter in chapter 4. He tells the storm, tells the seas to be still. They listen. When he teaches, people recognize this guy doesn't teach like our scribes, doesn't teach like our teachers. He teaches as someone with authority. And when he tells somebody to, to be well or to pick up their pallet and walk, they respond to his words. Um, and so when we get to chapter 5 and we see him coming into contact with this man, um, we already kind of got a picture. Like, we know who Jesus is. Who is this guy? And, uh, you know, what are some, what are some things that, that, that chapter 5 reveals about him? Don't know a whole lot about him other than he's, he's been tormented by this, this demon for, for quite some time. There's no really timeline on how, how long this, he's been affected by this, but uh, it causes him to cut himself, and he's, he's unable to be subdued by anybody. He's just in a, in a real bad state of affairs because of this demon possession. Yeah, and you know, I think we can probably, without stretching the imagination too very far, start drawing connections to our life today we, we understand uh, people aren't possessed by demons in the, the same sense as this but this idea you, you mentioned of uncontrolled unsubdued um, certainly it, it's not uncommon to meet someone who just seems they're just wild you know it can't be controlled we might even look and say that person is tormented mm -hmm. um and you get the notion, like, I want to help them. I don't think anybody can help them. Right. And I think you see that uh, in, in this account in Mark. It says that they had tried to bind him. Um, you know, Brad mentioned he was cutting himself. And so whether or not they were binding him to get him out of our hair or binding him up because we want to, we want to try to help this guy out and not hurt himself anymore, Whatever it was they were doing, it wasn't working. He's breaking these metal shackles. Uh, goes to show you the great strength that was um, was controlling him. The, these demons that are in control certainly have a lot of power. Uh, and we're going to see later on in the account that no one, I don't think anyone expected anyone to be able to control him. Uh, when you see this guy, you just try to stay out of his way. In fact, he's also in the in the tombs around dead people uh he's naked so very likely uh he's he's unclean he's not mm -hmm. someone that a a good self-respecting gent uh jew is going to going to touch and i think there's also maybe a chance that he's gentile as well uh the the region that he's in um i know mark calls it the garrisons uh matthew refers to it as the uh, the Gadarenes, mm -hmm. um, 
But this is a region known as Decapolis, and it's prominently Gentile. So he's not someone you would expect a guy like Jesus to spend much time with. Mm-hmm. Kind of to your point, what you were talking about, uh, about how we can draw some some similarities to us and this guy, he was he was crying out and just he wasn't be able to be eased. You know what I mean? We, we can get like that too when we have worries and stress and, and things like that that keep us away from, from Jesus and Christ. We can, we can experience that as well. So in some ways you can, you can kind of relate to just not being able to be at ease. You know, not having a peace about you, I guess, is a better way to put it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's probably one of the, the big things about this story that makes me, makes me really love the, the account but also gives me so much hope from it, mm-hmm. is when we start thinking about, one, we connect with this guy, like you just mentioned, that, that there are plenty of times when we feel tormented ourselves and we just feel like there's no one that can control this, no one that can aid us um, in how we're feeling. But then when we consider that Jesus goes to this place, maybe specifically because of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's not a lot of reason for a Jew to go to this area, to the other side. Of, this is across the Jordan. Um, uh, but yet, in the chapter before, he tells his disciples, we're going across the uh, the sea. We're, we're going to go over to the other side. So Jesus intends to go to this area. And when he gets there, he meets this guy that Seems like nobody can help. Um, and again, he meets a guy that is very likely ceremonially unclean. He meets a guy that is not is possibly not a Jew. Mm-hmm. And probably the biggest one out of this story that kind of stands out to me is he meets a guy that's naked. <laughs> and so it's very easy to look at this guy and go, this ain't my sort of people. <laughs> this ain't the guy that I want to hang out with. And yet, what we find next is just simply uh, amazing. Um, you know, he, you have the picture of the, uh, the, the demons bowing down. They, they make this guy bow down before Jesus, and they, they beg him. And what a comparison between what other people were able to do, and then Jesus just shows up uh, with, with them just begging, please don't torment us. Uh, and you know he permits them to to leave he, he commands them leave the guy permits them to enter into the swine um, but following that what picture do you see of the guy after you know we have the picture he's he's cutting himself he's naked uh, but but following that r- really how do we see this guy next time we see him well, he's in his right mind, so he's he's no longer possessed by a demon. We see him, see him as a picture of being at peace. You know, he's calm. He's not cutting himself. He's not wailing about. Certainly not subdued any, by anything. So we see him at peace because of the the um, peace that Christ has given him from healing him from the demon possession. Yeah, and and it, I think it's interesting. It mentions that he is no longer naked. He's mm-hmm. he's yeah. clothed in something and. What a fantastic picture of what Jesus offers. Because we, I think we have to assume, uh, even though the account doesn't imply where the clothing came from, if this guy is naked living in the tombs, probably doesn't have his change of clothes up there with him. <clears throat> but now that Jesus has removed the demons from him, uh, He's able to be in his right mind. He has peace and he has something on. And what a powerful picture of what Jesus offers to us. What a transformation. Yeah, no question. So as we, as we continue on through that, um, you know, again, just awe-inspiring to me, especially to think about myself, the, the many times in my life where I felt like peace is fleeting, um, and I felt like I'm a person that, that Jesus would not want to. I'm not his sort of people. And yet he offers peace. Mm-hmm. He offers a change of clothes. Literally, we can be clothed with Christ. Um, and that inspires awe. And it seems like from our account, it inspired awe in them too. But <laughs> they react certainly a way that you wouldn't expect. Yeah, very much so. 
you would you would think that there'd be a, a feast, a celebration about this guy because there's so many aspects of this. He was no longer tormenting the area, which means people could have a, a free free reign or free passage to anywhere without fearing him uh, tormenting them. And and but it's the fact that he's no longer tormented by this. You think there would be some celebration at this, but sadly, that's not that's not the case. Yeah, they are. Uh, it's it says that they are in awe of him, but then it also says that that this all leads them to beg Jesus to leave. You know the the demons. Beg Jesus, leave us alone. Don't don't torment us. Uh, and now these people are acting just like these demons. You know, I, I know we read the demons are sent into the swine, but you have to wonder if they <laughs> they weren't in also in these in these people because they act exactly yeah. like them. Good point. But then you see a maybe a comparison or a contrast to that mm-hmm. in this guy. What, what what's he do at the close of this account? He, he asked to go with Jesus. He begged to get in the boat and be with Jesus, which is, it's, it's unbelievable, the dichotomy between the people's reaction and his reaction. But he was probably going off of, of feeling at ease and at peace, and he knew Jesus could provide that, so why would you not want to be around him all the time? Exactly. I, I guess I have to wonder if maybe it was because he had personally, you know, he had experienced that. Yeah. He he knew what had happened to him. Um, all these others, they're they're hearing this account. One, they're hearing it from the herdsmen who just yeah. lost two thousand head of of swine. Yeah. So maybe the account isn't perfectly uh, given over to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there there could be some things in there. But the, the thing that stands out to me is when they ask Jesus to go. He doesn't, uh, you know, try to explain to him like, "Wait a minute, let me tell you what I did." Yeah. He he goes. Yeah, look, look what I can, he doesn't. He doesn't try to sell himself, so to speak. Look what I can offer you. Look what I've done to this guy. Look what I've done to to this this person. I can show you more of what I'm capable of doing. If you don't want him to be there, he'll leave. Just I want to pause and come back to something that you said about the people and recognizing him uh, that the demons. You know, he couldn't be the demon couldn't be subdued. And we reckon, and he recognized Christ when he got off the boat. And it's the, the contrast between these two people. They didn't believe anything. You know, they didn't believe what he had done and, and the miracles that he did. But even the demons themselves, who resided in this man, believed and feared Christ. Another thing, and this was something that that you had talked about earlier, that really uh, I thought was a fascinating point. He wants to go with Jesus, and Jesus says no to that too. He, he, yeah. You're not going to come with me. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus has another plan for him to stay and to tell your people, your friends, your the people that you're around, um, maybe even go and tell the Gentiles. But he says, I want you to stay, go home to your people, and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you. And while we might think for a minute, well, like that's that's really not fair. Like, why didn't he get to go and be with the 12 apostles? Why didn't he get to go and, and do that work? God has another plan for him. And the end result for that leads to a future interaction Yeah, uh, that, that really turns out to be a blessing for a lot more than just this man. Exactly. Uh, he goes about and he tells all his friends, and I'm not sure the time frame when, when, when this happened, but Jesus eventually comes back around to this area and everybody knows who he is. And there's, there's only one reason why. It's because this guy told everybody about what God had done for him. He Jesus, Jesus used him. Jesus used this guy. He didn't need him, but he used him to let everyone know about his power and what he can do for, for everyone. Yeah, and, and I think what a what of a powerful place for us to kind of draw the story of Jesus and this demon possessed man to to a conclusion. Mm-hmm. We can relate with him feeling like a people that aren't God's people at times. We're the kind of people that just wouldn't expect God won't have anything to do with us. And we have problems in our lives that we feel like there's just no one can can help us. No one can do something about this. And yet Jesus is revealed through the gospel as someone with power, power to assist, power to help, power to heal, power to give life, and power to remove uncontrollable situations, uncontrollable uh, pain and uncontrollable control of of these forces of, of wickedness. He can do something about that. 
But when he has done that for us and when we have been transformed by him, we have been clothed with him in Christ, we gain a responsibility. For sure. What are we going to, how are we going to recognize the grace that God has provided to us uh, in difficult situations, in impossible situations that mm-hmm. no one can can help us with these problems. How are we going to recognize what God offers through Jesus Christ? And then how are we going to, in turn, share that with others and create opportunities for them to bring the needs that they have to, to Jesus, to the one with the power to help, the one with the power to, to change. You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. We can go many, many places and, and read about how God sent Jesus. God so loved the world. You know, so he loves everybody and he desires every person to be saved. We can read many passages that, that state that. But if you reject him, he's not going to chase you. <laughs> he's, 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 to so to speak. He's not going to, I mean, he will seek you out, like the parable of the 99. He will seek you out. He'll seek you out like a lost sheep, but he's not going to hold you down and make you obey. We're not robots. We all have free will. But if you reject Jesus, he will let you reject him. He will he will let he will leave. So as we press on each day, uh, I hope we will think and consider about the things we learn from this interaction with an unlikely man and all powerful son of God. I hope we will remember that he is able to assist us and and heal us, free us in situations that seem hopeless. But I also hope that we will remember the power that we have to go and tell others what he is what the Lord has done for us. And remember the great opportunity that that provides them to come to Jesus and hear uh, hear what what he has to offer, to feel the power that he has to save. So we thank you very much for, for being with us. Uh, we hope that you will take just a moment to, to like this video, share it with others. Maybe you will be sharing the message of Jesus and the man with many demons with someone who needs and feels like their life is out of control right now. Whatever you do, we hope and pray that God will be glorified in it. We thank you so much, and we just ask you to, to close with this thought. What are you going to do with the Jesus of authority and power? What are you going to do with him today? Think about that. Thank you.